Hi everyone, my name is Joshua Lively and I'm a paleontologist specializing in biotas of the late Cretaceous. And today I want to thank you all for coming to my virtual presentation. It's a little bit different than most presentations I give, but during pandemic quarantine, this is a great way to share a little bit about my research over the past few years. So I've titled this talk Oceanfront Property in Eastern Utah uh, because on the Colorado Plateau we have the opportunity to look at both marine organisms that were living in the ocean during the late Cretaceous but also organisms that were living on land and in fresh water very close to one another. Uh, so we'll take a little bit of time during today's presentation and talk about my experiences working in both of these systems, freshwater and coastal settings, as well as the ocean. Now, the Cretaceous looked very different than today's world. Um, by then, the continents are starting to look like they kind of do today. Uh, India is still uh, far removed from the rest of Eurasia, uh, but compared to earlier time periods, the continents are starting to look familiar. The big thing that you'll notice is that there's no polar ice in the Antarctic or the Arctic, and because of that, uh, sea levels are much higher. Uh, and they were uh, much higher throughout this entire time interval from about 100 to 66 million years ago. Uh, now, we know that uh, the uh, uh, planet was most likely devoid of ice at the poles because temperatures were much, much hotter. In fact, recent projections suggest that uh, even uh, very close to Antarctica at the very high latitudes, both north and south, uh, that uh, temperatures could have ranged well over 25 or even 30 degrees Celsius uh, at the surface of the ocean. So much hotter than temperatures that you see in the high latitudes today. Now, this led to a very different landscape, specifically in North America as well. Uh, now, you'll notice the big key difference uh, with North America compared to today is the Western Interior Seaway. Uh, this seaway connected uh, what is today the Gulf of Mexico with the Arctic Ocean for a good chunk of the late Cretaceous, 100 to 66 million years ago. And it divided North America into two land masses, Appalachia to the east and Laramidia to the west. So most of today's talk will be focused on Laramidia and the Western Interior Seaway and the organisms that were living on that landmass and in that seaway. Now, if you've ever driven um, on I-70 between the San Rafael Swell and Grand Junction, and you look off to the north, you'll notice uh, these series of cliffs that are known as the Book Cliffs. Now, the Book Cliffs are beautiful in uh, their own right, just from a landscape perspective, but for a geologist, they tell a very interesting story. A story of a seaway that's far removed from us today, and rivers and deltas that were spilling into that seaway. So this is one view of a, a portion of the Book Cliffs. The Book Cliffs extend all the way back to the Wasatch Plateau. This particular uh, view is from one of my collaborators. Uh, this is in a town called Helper, uh, just outside of Price, Utah. And what you'll notice in all of these different cliff photos is that you have a gray slope-forming mudstone that uh, uh, makes up the bottom part of the book cliffs. And then capping these cliffs, you have a very different rock. This is uh, mostly sandstone. And these sandstones are made up of coastal and river um, deposits. And what's really neat is that this, uh, this represents very different environments and these rocks contain very different organisms when we start looking at the fossils that these rocks preserve. So if you go and look into any of those gray mudstones along the book cliffs, you're going to find marine organisms. You're going to find oysters, clams, ammonites, 
fish, and if you're really lucky, large marine reptiles like this mosasaur. Now, if you go look for fossils in those sandstones, in the coastal and floodplain and river deposits, you're going to find a very different environment. At this point, when those rocks were being deposited, rivers and deltas and floodplains were beginning to fill in the seaway. So the animals that were living in places like Utah and Colorado at that point were things like turtles, crocodilians, uh, freshwater fish, but also dinosaurs. Uh, so very different environments with rocks that are right on top of one another. And throughout my career, I've been lucky enough to work on organisms from both of uh, these different types of environments. So all of this work uh, that I'm going to talk about today starts out in the field. And that's one of my favorite parts of being a paleontologist, working with all of your close friends and colleagues in the field with a common goal, to make discoveries and learn more about the history of our planet. Uh, so I've spent quite a few years doing field work, mostly in Utah, as well as a little bit in Colorado and New Mexico, working with a lot of different groups uh, to excavate mostly vertebrate, but also invertebrate fossils, collect geologic data, and bring those fossils and those, informa uh, those data back to the lab to learn more about ancient environments. So a lot of a paleontologist's time gets spent in the field. A lot, at least a lot of my time gets spent in the field during the summer, but even more time is spent visiting museums, collecting data on a lot of different fossils uh, to be able to better understand these extinct organisms. Uh, so over the course of my master's and PhD program, I visited well over 20 different museums uh, to collect information and data on uh, the two main groups of fossil organisms that I've worked on, mosasaurs and freshwater turtles. So I mentioned uh, that I'll be telling you a little bit about both freshwater environments and their organisms as well as uh, organisms uh, that were living within uh, that western interior seaway. So I'm going to start off on land, on this landmass, Laramidia, and talk about um, animals that were living in lakes, rivers, and on the floodplains around those uh, major river systems. Uh, this image that you're seeing here on the screen, uh, this is a view of the Kaparowitz Formation in Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in southern Utah. This is actually where I got my start as a vertebrate paleontologist. And this is a map view of uh, where uh, we are in Utah, the south central portion of the state. And that darker shaded area is where we have outcrops of the Kaparowitz Formation. Now, all of those different gray and tan colored rocks, they're a different environment than the gray rocks that you see uh, forming those slopes up in uh, the Book Cliffs. All of these mudstones and sandstones were deposited in rivers, lakes, and floodplains. So the muddy intervals, those are actually just floodplain muds where you get mud being deposited during floods. Now, when we look at these badlands, they're a really great place to find lots of different organisms that were living from 77 to about 75 million years ago. The most famous group of uh, organisms that we find in these rocks are, of course, dinosaurs. And they get a lot of attention. Uh, we have a lot of great dinosaur fossils from the Kaparowitz Formation from southern Utah. And uh, all of these are on display in uh, the Natural History Museum of Utah in Salt Lake City. And for paleontologists that have studied dinosaurs in this area, uh, they have developed a really interesting hypothesis um, by studying the dinosaurs that you get in Utah, New Mexico, and also looking at the animals that you see further north in places like modern-day Montana and Alberta. And it turns out, uh, at the same time that these rocks were being deposited in what's now the Kaparowitz Formation, you had 
rocks being deposited up in Alberta in what is now known as the Dinosaur Park Formation. Both of these different rock formations preserve a very diverse biota. Dinosaurs, crocs, turtles, invertebrates, all over the place. Um, and what happens though when you compare the assemblage of fossils uh, between the Kaparowitz and the Dinosaur Park Formation, paleontologists begin to recognize that you actually don't really get a lot of overlap between the organisms that you get in those two different uh, fossil ecosystems. And this led dinosaur paleontologists specifically to suggest that you had these large animals roaming over very restricted areas. So instead of these elephant-sized uh, animals roaming up and down Laramidia, they were actually restricted to very small areas. Some maybe the areas of you know, a single river drainage, whereas others may have roamed from southern Utah down to Texas. Uh, now this uh, hypothesis is called provinciality. Uh, this means that different organisms were living in different biotic provinces. In this case, you would have a northern province uh, in Alberta and Montana and a southern province in Utah, New Mexico, and Texas. Uh, now, there's still a lot of disagreement amongst paleontologists about uh, whether uh, these formations are the same age, uh, whether the uh, dinosaurs could have actually roamed up and down across this uh, very narrow landmass. Um, so I wanted to take that hypothesis uh, that had been pro proposed by dinosaur paleontologists and test it with a completely different group of organisms. So that's what led me to work on turtles. Uh, this was my master's project at the University of Utah, and I chose to work on a group of turtles called Bainid turtles. Now, Bainids are some of the more abundant turtles that we find in the fossil record in Upper Cretaceous rocks. Uh, they're no longer uh, living on the planet. Uh, they went extinct about 45 million years ago, but during the Cretaceous, they were the most abundant and uh, most diverse group of turtles in Western North America. Uh, and when we go out in the field, when we uh, you know, go on these expeditions to places like Southern Utah, it seems like for every dinosaur we find, we find 10 or 20 turtles. So because of that, they're actually a really great study system for asking biological questions in the fossil record because you have this huge sample size. Uh, so I had a ton of fossils to work with uh, during this project. And what I discovered is that in the Kaparowitz formation, we have at least six different species of bayonid turtles. Three of those species were brand new to science have been discovered nowhere else in Western North America. So I found two new species of Neurankylus in museums uh, across Western North America, as well as a brand new genus and species called Arvenachilles goldeneye. And I've recorded a separate video about why Arvenachilles is my favorite fossil. So go check it out as well. Uh, now, we have six different species in the Kaparowitz Formation in Utah. Uh, if you compare that with that same aged formation further north in the Dinosaur Park Formation, you see, number one, only three species, so lower diversity, but also something else that's really interesting is that none of the species that are in the Kaparowitz are found in uh, the Dinosaur Park Formation. So no overlap between those two assemblages of turtles. So I thought that's really interesting. We've got lower diversity further north uh, and none of the same species. Some of them are closely related uh, to the turtles that we have in Utah, but they're different, uh, different species, and that's kind of an interesting story. So why is that interesting? Uh, for starters, let's take a look at this. Um, beyond the dinosaur park formation, uh, there's another formation, uh, the Judith River, and actually a, a second one, the Two Medicine Formation in Montana, uh, 
that, uh, those formations in Montana actually preserved the same bayonet turtles that you get in Alberta. If we look to the south, uh, the Kaparowitz formation shares a number of species with New Mexico, as well as at least one uh, with uh, uh, the Aguja formation in West Texas. Uh, the pattern that we see in the south, some of these species are ranging over that whole southern area from Utah to Texas. Some of those species are restricted to a single formation, like a single river drainage. Things like our vena Keeleys and those two new species of Neurankylis that I discovered. Um, so, what's going on here? It's an interesting pattern. Different assemblages, very similar to the pattern that we get with dinosaurs, but also you get a much higher diversity to the south. So, why is this surprising? If we go and look at modern turtles, you actually do see a drop in diversity the further north you get. Um, but remember, during the Cretaceous, northern high latitudes, also southern high latitudes, were much warmer than they are today. And that leads to a reduced thermal gradient. That means that there was less of a difference between the high latitudes, the temperature at high latitudes, and the temperature at the equator. So the hypothesis that normally goes, normally goes along with that is that during these uh, globally warm greenhouse climates, you should have cold-blooded or ecto, uh, ectothermic organisms being able to range over really broad geographic areas from north to south. But that's actually not the pattern that we see. The expected uh, the pattern doesn't hold for these ectotherms. They're instead restricted to these smaller drainage basins. So it turns out when we expected that uh, these turtles and potentially other ectothermic organisms would have larger geographic ranges similar to today's painted turtle, uh, that's not actually the pattern that we see. Some of them yeah, were regional, say in southern Laramidia or northern Laramidia, but some species just like today, and uh, uh, specifically different species of map turtles, like the Alabama map turtle here, uh, they were actually restricted to single or maybe just a couple of river drainages. So not the pattern that we actually expect for greenhouse, globally warm climates, but a similar pattern to what the dinosaurs were showing us too. So just to give a brief overview of what we've learned then uh, by looking at freshwater and terrestrial organisms during the late Cretaceous is that you seem to have two distinct assemblages of fossils around 77 million years ago. This seems to apply to dinosaurs and it definitely applies to turtles as well. Uh, now, some of these animals were ranging over you know, regional areas, uh, so from Texas to Utah or Montana to Alberta, but those two different assemblages didn't mix. Uh, now the one question that hasn't been an answered is that if we do have two biotic provinces, at least with turtles, what was the nature of the boundary between those two? The problem is we don't have a lot of turtle fossils from areas like central Utah, the Book Cliffs, or the Rock Springs Uplift in southwestern Wyoming. The only way we can test um, this hypothesis any further, figure out what these, uh, the border of these uh, potential biotic provinces looked like, is to go out in the field in places like the Neslin Formation, uh, the Mesa Verde Group in central northeastern Utah and southwestern uh, Wyoming and begin finding fossils. So still quite a bit to learn when it comes to uh, these terrestrial and freshwater biotas of the late Cretaceous. So now let's talk about the Western Interior Seaway and the animals that were living within it. Now my focus for my PhD uh, was on one particular group of organisms from the Western Interior Seaway, Mosasaurs. Now, mosasaurs are marine lizards uh, that ranged in size from just a couple of meters in length to really large sizes. 
This Tylosaurus on the screen right now, just to give you a sense of perspective, is chasing down a five or six foot tall bird called Hesperornis. Uh, Tylosaurus is, well, huge. Uh, they could grow up uh, uh, to sizes well over 45, maybe even 50 feet in length. Uh, what are Mosasaurs specifically? What are they related to? Uh, the vast majority of folks over the years have suggested that Mosasaurs were closely related to monitor lizards, that they were definitely uh, more closely related to non-snake lizards. Uh, but there are quite a few solid arguments to suggest that Mosasaurs are actually much more closely related to snakes. Either way, uh, whichever hypothesis you accept, uh, mosasaurs were marine lizards. And thankfully today, uh, thanks to Hollywood, a few more people know what a mosasaur is. They're still not as famous as dinosaurs that were living on land, uh, but thanks to the last two Jurassic World movies, I can finally talk about mosasaurs in public and folks kind of know what I'm talking about. Uh, Mosasaur research has come a long way over the years. Uh, they were originally thought of as these very serpentine uh, type organisms, but now we know that they were very dynamic swimmers and they were potentially even able to keep an elevated uh, temperature, uh, a constant temperature. Um, so now with more complete fossils, we can say that uh, Mosasaurs were actually these sleek torpedo-shaped predators uh, that really came to dominate the oceans in the latest Cretaceous. Uh, one thing that's really neat is that we do find a ton of fossils of Mosasaurs. Uh, they are very well represented in museums uh, all across North America and all around the world. Uh, so just like with turtles, you can really start to ask some interesting biological questions about Mosasaurs. Uh, now, something that's neat about working in the seaway uh, compared to working in these continental deposits that were laid down on the Laramidian landmass is that you have more continuous time represented. And because of that, you can really get into the nuts and bolts of the evolution of different groups of organisms that were living within the seaway. So I spent a lot of my PhD thinking about one particular group of mosasaurs called the mosasaurines. These were really interesting to me because by the end of the Cretaceous, they diversified into a lot of different groups, filling numerous different niches within the marine ecosystem. Uh, so there were smaller mosasaurs. There are much larger ones that uh, we can tell based on their teeth and their gut contents were eating fish. There were some mosasaurs that were specialized on clams and other hard-shelled organisms, things like globidins, this animal in the upper uh, right. Uh, based on teeth and gut contents, we can say that some animals, like pronathodon, uh, a type of mosasaurine mosasaur, ate pretty much everything it could fit inside its mouth. Uh, there have been uh, fish, turtles, um, sharks, even other mosasaurs found in uh, the gut contents of uh, some of those animals. Uh, so mosasaurs, uh, especially right at the very end of the Cretaceous, were very, very diverse. Uh, when they went extinct uh, with uh, the dinosaurs on land 66 million years ago, they were really at their peak of diversity. But the Mosasaurine Mosasaurs started out uh, with a very low diversity. Most of them looked like this animal right here uh, called Clydastes. This particular specimen is on exhibit at uh, the University of Kansas at their uh, Natural History Museum. So for about the first you know, six, seven, eight million years of the evolution of Mosasaurines, most of them looked like uh, this animal right here not too exciting, probably just a generalist in its ecosystem, and not really getting longer than five meters or about 15 feet in length. But just a little bit later in time, uh, 
at least by 75 million years ago, uh, mosasaurs had diversified into a lot of different forms, and especially what we've considered two lineages, the Globodenzini and the Mosasaurini. Uh, things like Mosasaurus, uh, at the bottom of the screen and Pronathodon up at the top of the screen with very different um, skeletal skull architectures. Uh, the Globodenzini had these much more robust blunt skulls for uh, uh, not just crushing ammonites and clams like Globodens, but with Pronathodon crushing everything that was smaller than it. Whereas the Mosasaurini uh, Mosasaurs were more fish specialists, we think. So one of the big questions for my PhD was trying to figure out when, where, and how this diversification occurred in the Western Interior Seaway, because most of this group's fossil record is very well represented in the Western Interior Seaway. How do you go from these relatively small generalist mosasaurs to this very diverse group? So this involved going around to a lot of different museum collections uh, over uh, my PhD. And one of the specimens that I ended up uh, spending a lot of time with and thinking a lot about is Pronathodon stopmani. This is a mosasaur that's in the collections at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. Uh, now it was collected from uh, deposits in the Manco Shale in Colorado. So a little bit about Pronathodon stopmani. Uh, it was discovered in Delta County, Colorado, in the Mancos Shale. Uh, based on some field work, which I'll talk about in just a second, uh, we know it lived between somewhere between 81 and 79 million years ago. Uh, the skull on this animal is huge. Here's a forklift for scale. Uh, these lower jaws for this animal are pretty much four feet in length, 1.2 meters. And we don't have a complete skeleton. We just have uh, a nice skull and some parts of the spine, the vertebral column. Uh, but based on the proportions of the skull and measurements of more complete mosasaurs, we can hypothesize that this animal was at least 36 feet long. So that's a very large lizard that was swimming around in the oceans and much larger than those 15 foot clydastes that were living earlier in time. Now, as one part of this project was going back and locating where this animal was first dug up in Delta County, Colorado. The reason I wanted to do this is because I wanted to narrow down more specifically where in time uh, this uh, mosasaur was living. And that requires you to figure out where within the package of rocks called the Manco Shale this mosasaur was discovered. So based on some kind of vague uh, uh, locality data, no GPS uh, uh, was used when this animal was collected back in 1975. Based on those uh, some vague locality data and the excavation photo there on the right hand side of your screen, I was able to track down the locality that Pronathodon stopmani was dug up, mostly thanks to this really scraggly looking tree that's being indicated by the arrow there. Uh, and uh, sure enough, uh, I uh, uh, talked to uh, uh, the uh, amateur paleontologist Gary Thompson who found uh, this mosasaur and it checks out. This is the right site. Uh, so with this, we were able to say where in section this mosasaur uh, was discovered and uh, with a little bit more work, uh, the, uh, the age, the rough age range of this mosasaur. Now I'm also gonna talk about a second uh, mosasaur. This is again another mosasaur that was found uh, by an avocational paleontologist named John Jackson in Texas, just outside of Austin, Texas in Williamson County. Very different landscape, not the badlands of western Colorado. This was in a river cut uh, along a river in central Texas. Uh, this uh, specimen uh, includes a good chunk of the skull, quite a bit of uh, the vertebral column, as well as some of the limb material. And out of sheer luck, working in a museum uh, back in my hometown of Birmingham, Alabama, it turns out a second specimen of this same species was discovered by another avocational paleontologist in central Alabama. So with uh, 
these two different specimens that actually have some overlapping bones, but also some uh, uh, unique portions of the skeleton, I was able to reconstruct this um, uh, specimen and uh, or this species from these two specimens. And this is roughly what it looks like. Uh, known from the Taylor Group of Texas and the Morville Chalk of Alabama, uh, this animal uh, was around roughly between 84 and 79 million years ago. Uh, with a skull length of about 85 uh, centimeters, which means that this animal, not quite as big as Pronathodon stopmani, but still bigger than all those Clydastes earlier in time, uh, at around 25 feet in length. Now, when I, uh, I was uh, first shown this fossil by uh, my collaborator, John Jackson, uh, I had a hunch, well, is this some new species of Clydastes? it looks really similar to these early Mosasaurine Mosasaurs. So maybe it's just a big Clydastes. Um, but looking at the nitty gritty details of the anatomy, which you have to do when you're a vertebrate paleontologist, one thing that sets this animal apart from all of the earlier Mosasaurines, uh, that group Clydastes, uh, is that the teeth, as you move through the jaw, are very different. The teeth in the front of the jaw are very thin, curved, and uh, don't have any sort of slicing edge. Uh, if you move back through the jaw, the teeth get a lot more robust, uh, a lot more uh, rounded. Uh, there's a cutting edge to them. Uh, so this is a, a term, uh, a term that we use to describe this uh, sort of... Uh, uh, dental work is uh, a heterodonty. So if you look at your own teeth, you'll notice that you have incisors, canines, premolars, and molars as you move back through the, the jaw. Um, now, this uh, uh, mosasaur didn't have that same degree of heterodonty that we do, but uh, you do have more robust, uh, stronger teeth as you move back through the jaw. This wasn't the case in earlier mosasaurians. But one thing that's really neat is that this pattern of uh, tooth anatomy does show up in later mosasaurs like Pronathodon. You get those thinner curved teeth in the front of the jaw and more rounded, robust teeth further back. And this is often thought to uh, be associated with processing larger, more robust prey items. Another interesting feature about this new mosasaur from Texas and Alabama is this little depression on the back end of the lower jaw. I'll show that again. It's uh, marked by a ridge on the lateral surface of uh, the lower jaw. And that ridge kind of marks the bottom of this uh, uh, depression or fossa on the side of the lower jaw. So that new animal from Texas and Alabama has it. Pronathodon stopmani also has that same depression, that same fossa. Now why is this significant, that little shelf of bone and the depression right next to it? If we look at modern lizards, some modern lizards have that same uh, shelf of bone. Uh, a good example is Crotophytus, the collared lizard. A closely related lizard, Gambelia, uh, the leopard lizard, does not have that shelf of bone. What does that look like on the actual animal? Collared lizards, Crotophytus, have these really large jowls, these really big jaw muscles uh, that are associated with a big bite force, especially when compared to leopard lizards. So, if we use these modern analogs in lizards, like the collared lizard, and take that back in the fossil record, we can then say that Pronathodon stopmani, uh, other species of Pronathodon later in time, as well as our new Mosasaur from Texas and Alabama, all had much larger jaw muscles compared to other Mosasaurs. So that same fossa, that same site for muscle attachment uh, is present in this animal uh, at the top of the screen, Pronathodon overtoni, that lived later in time, 75 million years ago, uh, compared to Pronathodon stopmani and our new animal from Texas. Uh, 
but you don't see that same muscle attachment site in Mosasaurus and most other Mosasaurine Mosasaurs. So this tells us then that these uh, two uh, Mosasaurs that I've talked mostly about so far had uh, in, uh, in, on one side had a very large set of jaw muscles that would have been associated with a very powerful bite but then also had this interesting dentition, especially the uh, animal from Texas, uh, with the curved teeth at the front and the more robust teeth at the back. And that's often associated with, uh, at least in modern lizards like Crotophytus, it's in part associated with male-on-male -male combat, but it's also associated with being able to consume larger prey items. And one thing I should say is that earlier Mosasaurs, uh, like Clydastes, also lack that, that uh, bony signature for those large jaw muscles. Uh, so this is something new that shows up in uh, these couple of Mosasaurs from Texas and Colorado, uh, something that we get later in time. So when you add these new Mosasaurs into the family tree, uh, it turns out that uh, the family tree of Mosasaurs gets shifted around. So traditionally, you had a close relationship between Pronathodon and Globodins. These two animals with really robust skulls and different teeth, depending on where you are in the, in the jaw. Uh, but adding in the new animal from Texas and Alabama and Pronathodon stopmani, which a lot of people had not done thus far, uh, you get a very different uh, pattern to the family tree of Mosasaurs. And when you start mapping out this family tree or phylogeny on a timeline and start looking at the changes in the anatomy through time, you can start to pick up on an interesting pattern that relates to the paleoecology of these animals. So I've talked a bit about tooth shape. Tooth shape is directly associated with what an animal was eating. Uh, the animals highlighted in yellow here uh, have kind of a more um, uh, recurved slicing uh, tooth anatomy that's associated with eating fish. So things like Clydastes early on, as well as Mosasaurus, were probably either you know, kind of generalists or you know, maybe uh, maybe even fish specialists is what we think of uh, with Mosasaurus specifically. Uh, but when you have a more robust dentition, uh, like Globodins highlighted in blue down here at the bottom, you can uh, you know, eat harder uh, shelled organisms. Or if you have more robust teeth and also very large jaw muscles, then you can potentially begin processing not just more tough, tougher prey, hard shell prey, but also larger prey items. So when we get this new Mosasaur that I should say still isn't named uh, from Texas and Alabama, as well as Pronathodon stopmani, uh, they're showing up in the fossil record somewhere between 84 and 79 million years ago. That's at a time when these mosasaurs are starting to uh, uh, show new and diverse tooth morphologies. So you're starting to get uh, an idea that these animals are starting to eat new things in their ecosystem, beginning to fill new ecological niches. And this led to uh, another part of my PhD project, looking at something called disparity. Most folks have heard of the term diversity. Taxonomic diversity specifically is related to the number of species within uh, an, an environment, within a habitat, uh, within an ecosystem, or globally even, if you're talking about global biodiversity. So in this, uh, in this example, uh, each uh, colored circle is a different species. Uh, disparity is different. It's not just the number of species, but it's also related to how similar they are. So if we're using color as our proxy for the number of species with these different shapes here, uh, you have the same 
taxonomic diversity on the left and the right. But you'll notice the shapes are very different from one another on uh, the right hand side of the screen. So that means when you have these very different shapes, these very different anatomy uh, anatomies between uh, different species, that means that your disparity is high. And that's telling you that there's potentially less overlap between different organisms in what they're doing in the environment. So if we do this with this uh, group of mosasaurs that I've been uh, focusing on so far, if we look early on in their history, uh, and we quantify all those different anatomical features across the skeleton. Uh, in this case, I've actually used uh, close to 200 features in the skeleton of these animals. Uh, you actually get the predicted outcome early on in their uh, other early on in their evolution, where for the first uh, uh, this uh, six million year chunk of time most of these mosasaurs all look very similar to one another. So there's low disparity. They're filling you know, a similar space uh, in, uh, in morphospace. Uh, their anatomy is all, of, all very similar to one another. When you get a little bit later in time, between 84 and 78 million years ago, that's when you start seeing these new mosasaurs showing up with these new dental morphologies, these uh, new tooth shapes. And uh, this includes Pronathodon stop mani, as well as our new mosasaur from Texas and Alabama. So one thing I'll point out though, this uh, purple star right here is our new animal from Texas and Alabama. And even though it's very different in its teeth and its jaw musculature compared to Clydastes earlier in time, it actually doesn't fall off that far away from these earlier mosasaurs. So that's telling you then that before there was this big increase in anatomical diversity or disparity, these animals were starting to evolve new feeding ecologies. So essentially this new species is a Clydastes or something that looks very much like one that has a different jaw and dental setup and was uh, very likely eating different things in the environment. Now that higher disparity compared to the first six million years of Mosasaur evolution that I've got on here, uh, that high disparity continues throughout the rest of the Cretaceous and is associated with brand new species and brand new morphotypes of Mosasaurs that show up in uh, the oceans. And you get that high disparity all the way to the very end of the Cretaceous when Mosasaurs ultimately go extinct. So I did a little bit more work on Mosasaur disparity looking at other groups of Mosasaurs that I don't really have time to share today. But one thing that I was interested in trying to explore was whether or not there was an environmental signal associated with the diversification and increase in disparity in Mosasaurs. Um, what I ultimately found is that Mosasaurs actually originated uh, at a time when global temperatures were at their highest. So some of the highest temperatures that we've experienced in the past hundred million years of this planet was the time when Mosasaurs first originated. And after their origin, you get two separate periods of Mosasaur diversification. Uh, and increases in disparity. In blue, roughly between 88 and 84 million years ago, this is when a group of mosasaurs called Plyoplatocarpines diversified. Uh, but then at least in the Western Interior Seaway, they drop off pretty quickly and highlighted in orange between about 84 and 79 million years ago, that's when mosasaurines begin to di diversify. This is all during a period when global temperatures are cooling off from those maximum temperatures uh, around 98 million years ago. And what we find is that mosasaurine mosasaurs continue on with that high level of disparity and diversity throughout the rest of the Cretaceous when we still have really high global temperatures, but they're relatively cooler for most of this time at least compared to earlier on in the Cretaceous. Now, is it clear that there's 
an environmental signal associated with the evolution of mosasaurs, I'm not confident enough to say that yet. I think we still need to collect uh, more data on temperature and other environmental proxies uh, across the Western Interior Seaway and world, and also better constrain where in time all these different mosasaurs are occurring before we can really do a solid statistical analysis to compare environmental parameters and the evolution of mosasaurs. But it's just a pattern uh, uh, that uh, I've noticed so far and maybe something that we can pay attention to in the future. But some very clear conclusions that I can pull from uh, my mosasaur work is that including these new fossils in uh, the phylogeny, in the family tree of mosasaurs, actually rearranges uh, greatly our understanding of the pattern of diversification of these mosasaurs. It's very clear that before that diversification occurs, uh, you had an expansion in the feeding ecology of these animals. You had indications for increases in jaw musculature size, at least in some mosasaurs, and also associated with that, you had new tooth uh, morphologies that are most likely associated with the ability to process larger, more robust, tougher prey. So, is that diversification then associated with this expanding feeding ecology? I think so. Uh, could it also be associated with some environmental factor, whether it's temperature or something else in the oceans? Possibly. Uh, but I think it's very clear that we have an interesting story uh, when we uh, begin looking at uh, the potential feeding ecologies of these animals and how that's tied to their diversification uh, within the Western Interior Seaway and beyond. So when I think back to both our discussion of uh, freshwater and terrestrial environments as well as uh, the Western Interior Seaway and the organisms that are living in uh, these different ecosystems through the Lake Cretaceous, uh, there's still a lot that we have to learn. I'm really interested in this as a system to study because it's one of our best proxies to better understand evolution and ecosystem change in a period of very warm global climate. So if we want to understand where our planet could potentially be heading with uh, modern modern day global warming, then maybe learning more about the Cretaceous, both the animals living in rivers and lakes and floodplains, as well as uh, those animals living in uh, the marine environment, maybe that's our key to understanding what the future of our planet can look like. We've already learned uh, things that we wouldn't have expected about the distribution of turtles and uh, other ectothermic or cold-blooded organisms during that time. And we're beginning now to learn a little bit more about organisms living in the oceans as well. So there's more to come and a lot of outcrop, especially on the Colorado Plateau, that still needs to be explored. So I want to thank all of those museums, uh, at least 2021, 20, that have hosted me uh, over the last decade of my uh, research career. Uh, without natural history museums, we would not be able to do uh, this amazing work. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're really the places that act as our libraries uh, as a paleontologist. Uh, we can go back and look at specimens that were collected 120, 130 years ago and bring them into these new statistical analyses and be able to learn more about uh, our, um, our Earth's history uh, through these museums. And thanks to many others uh, that have helped me uh, along the way through graduate school and as I began uh, my professional career. And I really want to thank you all, too, uh, for attending uh, this virtual uh, uh, presentation. And I look forward to seeing you all in person, whether it be in the museum or in the field, uh, once this pandemic is over.